Uh, okay, um, it's 5.30, so let me welcome everyone to this uh, Center for Ideas and Society event, Beyond Black Friday. Um, thank you for being here. And uh, to turn things over to uh, our fearless co-director, Dylan Rodriguez. Good evening, everybody. Um, mic check, you hear me good, right? Yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dylan Rodriguez. I'm, I'll go by he, him pronouns. I'm the co-director of the Center for Ideas and Society. Uh, I've been a faculty member here at UC Riverside for going on 21 years. I'm speaking to you from my office on campus, which is on occupied Cahuilla, Gabrieleño and Luceno lands, and is right down the street from where, the, from where the Riverside Police Department stole the life of Taisha Miller in 1998, shortly before I became an employee here. I wanna welcome all of you on behalf of the Center for Ideas and Society. Uh, the Center for Ideas and Society is an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research support center that's dedicated to advancing humanistic studies, intellectual exchange and creativity at UC Riverside. It's my pleasure, my honor to introduce this evening's event Beyond Black Friday, a conversation between one of our graduates, uh, Andrea Vidaure, who's also the co-founder of the People's Collective for Environmental Justice, uh, and our UC Riverside colleagues, Catherine Gudis, Ellen Reese, and Susan Zeger. So Black Friday, as many of us have experienced, is very much a racial capitalist ceremony. Certainly it is most obviously a ceremony of urgent enthusiastic consumption. It is in excess of that, a spectacle of capitalist liberty, which is to say the nominal freedom to satisfy the compulsory urge of the property relation which is also the chattel relation that forms and reproduces the wretchedness of civilization. Beyond this, Black Friday is a ceremony of grinding, exploitation, and toxification. This is what I think we're gonna hear and learn about this evening. Black Friday is a tribute of sorts to the cultural production of racial capitalism as a consumption without end, an endless consumption in which human insecurities are naturalized as the collateral damage of the consumer celebration the consumer celebration that is of wage insecurity, food insecurity, housing insecurity, health insecurity, and importantly, recreational and pleasure insecurity. Black Friday is a violent grind for working people in the Inland Empire and its infrastructure prevails on it as it reproduces anti-Blackness colonial power and racial capitalism's foundational logic of warfare. As I've shared with uh, the convener of this evening's event, Susan Zeger, I am a fanboy. I am a fanboy of this project. I am a student of this project, uh, and I look forward to learning so much from you all. So as I pass the microphone to Susan, I thank you again for allowing the Center for Ideas and Society to be part of this project. And I'm really looking forward to learning from all of you this evening. Susan. Thank you so much, Dylan. That was um, a perfect introduction. And um, those are the issues that we're going to excavate. Um, so let me uh, quickly add that we are recording this session um, for all those who are here. Uh, so thank you to Dylan uh, and thank you, uh, Catherine and Jessica, um, also at the Center for Ideas and Society um, and as well as uh, Jeanette Cole, the co-director. So I'm just going to say a few kind of um, more mundane facts to just orient us to Black Friday, um, you know, building on what uh, Dylan has said. And uh, I'll say a little bit about my project and then um, each of our panelists will talk about their work um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So uh, to review the Black Friday phenomenon and much of this will be familiar to you, uh, it really begins in the early aughts and it coincides with our present period of heightened logistics. So it's a very much a United States phenomenon that also has global aspirations. Um, the term itself, Black Friday, has a longer history starting in mid-century and it just referred to the heightened foot traffic and car traffic that started the Christmas shopping season. Um, and it was also a day of worker shortages when people would call in sick after Thanksgiving to score a four-day weekend. By the 1980s, it acquired this sense of um, retailers moving from operating in the red to operating in the black in terms of like accounting ink, um, because that symbolizes their holiday sales taking off. 
Um, so really that's, that's sort of the long background, but by the early 21st century, Black Friday is spawning scenes of um, mayhem and even fatalities. And so what I'd like to show you is um, not my email, but this website, I hope you can see, this is a Black Friday death count. Uh, and it's, it's really horrible reading. Um, you know, the, this is the sort of spectacle that gets, has, you know, been associated with people trying to grab televisions and um, everything else that might be on sale. So people have taken it upon themselves to catalog all these things, uh, all these instances of people being trampled and wounded and shot and stabbed over parking spots and consumer electronics and all the rest. And you can see the timeline, it's all over the country. Um, there's a bunch in California and the timeline goes back to um, the early 2000s. So I'm not gonna, you know, kind of belabor this. Uh, it's easy for you to kind of go to go there yourself if you wanna dwell in it. Um, but I just to show it to you to kind of give a sense of um, how Black Friday operates in the news and in discourse. And so you can sort of see like this, the media spectacle of what we're gonna unpack um, in our comments. So, um, I think, you know, in, in this way, the blotter is sort of suggesting this um, grotesque kind of dystopian parody of Thanksgiving gratitude. And this is the ugly violence that's undergirding ordinary US consumerism and it's like bursting into full view. Um, so I, I feel like that's where the blotter, the, you know, Black Friday death count is kind of coming in. But in a sense, we're already beyond Black Friday, um, but only because Black Friday has metastasized. So in 2015, Amazon introduced Black Friday in July, and that was intended to juice sales like even in the summer, um, and most likely also to ease some logistical strain by spreading it out. Um, and this was also the logic whereby retailers pushed the start of Black Friday into Gray Thursday or Brown Thursday and forward into Cyber Monday. Until now, I think this year, if you've you know looked around online, the deals are just Black Friday is not contained to the Friday at all. It's just sort of like a week, a month, like this indeterminate season. Um, so as online sales overtake in-person shopping, all that, you know, the spectacle and the violence, the overnight queuing, the door busting, the chaos, I think all that might wane. Um, and that has certainly been accelerated by the pandemic last year when foot traffic in stores fell um, by estimates of at least 20%, if not more, um, as did all of the deals um, due to supply chain shortages. So that's kind of the moment in which we find ourselves now. Another way in which we're thinking of beyond Black Friday is, um, you know, where, where is Black Friday in 2021 and going forward into the future? Um, how is it changing even as we're sort of recounting its, its short 21st century history? So uh, that's just to kind of orient all of you to like what it is. Um, to say a little bit about my interest in this, um, I find it interesting as an informal social practice, and I think, Dylan, you put it perfectly to call it um, a racial capitalist ceremony. Uh, and, and I'm interested in that because I'm writing a book called Logistical Life. And it's a very broad, um, basic kind of book that is gonna suggest that modernity is logistical and our lives are impacted by logistics, which I define as the efficient movement of goods, people and information in order to optimize profit. So when I think about that, um, I'm talking about the present and things like Black Friday, but I'm also giving it a denser history because the history of logistics as it's sort of understood uh, if people think about it, they go right to the shipping container and um, to the you know post-war period, 60s and 70s, and that they feel is the origin of logistics. Um, but that's really only one node uh, in the history of it when it intensified. 
Um, what I like to do, uh, and this is pinging off um, Dylan's point about racial capitalism, is to actually go back to the Atlantic slave trade in the 18th century. Um, that's a moment in which, uh, you know, people were to sort of, again, continue this idea of logistical life. In the Middle Passage, you know, um, enslaved people are sort of packed um, as if they're cargo, right? And yet, of course, they're living people. So there's this moment in which the human is coming into view um, in relation to logistical calculation, how many people can be transported, um, you know, to optimize the financial profit of the slave trade. Um, so, you know, that's one historical moment and there are many others, um, but that's why I'm making it a long durée history of, you know, like 250 years. Um, so in order, rather than like marching through that history, like starting in the 1750s and like ending in 2020, I'm trying to kind of um, ping back and forth between historical nodes so that we can see how that past is still very relevant in this moment. And to do that, I've organized the book um, through different metaphors. This is where my background as um, an English literature professor comes in. So um, I, I'm not a historian or a sociologist or, you know, someone who's sort of working directly, you know, with people dealing with logistics, um, as some of my co-panelists are. I'm thinking about it from a kind of textual, discursive, conceptual, metaphorical way. Um, so for me, I'm dividing the book into the metaphors that we use to think about logistics. So for example, flow is a technical term to describe in you know, the management science of where goods are going. Um, but flow is also a more intuitive kind of thing that we can feel and that we might experience in our own lives as workers, for example. So I have a chapter about that. I have a chapter about the logistical nightmare, which is when everything is supposed to come together at a certain place and time in a certain way, and instead it's completely screwed up. Um, so that's how I kind of uh, bring together a broad description of logistics in the modern world as an effect of racial capitalism, as something that um, has an environmental dimension, um, you know, that's insalubrious to say the, the least. Um, and and that's, um, that's what I've been working on. So because my project is so overarching and general, it's, it's this massive kind of thing to try to describe modern history in terms of logistics. Um, I very much wanted to convene this panel to come back to our hometown, to come back to Riverside, to our campus and, and the Inland Empire, and to make sure that my book has a grounding and a footing in the place where I work. Um, and so this is kind of following on the heels of um, a wonderful book by uh, our former colleague Edna Bonasich and um, her co-writer uh, Jake Ali Mohamed, who um, is also Ellen's co-writer on the book that she'll be discussing and who unfortunately couldn't make it to this panel. Um, but their work is, is a kind of grounding and fundamental for thinking about how logistics operates in the Inland Empire. And that was written back in 2008. And um, in you know, the subsequent time, things have only uh, you know, kind of changed and, and mushroomed and and intensified. So there's um, a lot more going on uh, that they, you know, than they thought of, but that they also anticipated. So, uh, you know, I think to, to kind of wrap it up and, and hand things over, um, I feel that like a lot of logistics, thinking about logistics takes place at like the macro global level and at the micro local level. And because my project is sort of global and macro, um, I want to have the micro and the local um, as well. And I know that many of my students work in warehouses in the area. Um, and if you are a logistics worker in the audience, um, you know, I would love to hear from you in the Q&A. Um, you know, you're, you're a you know, part of this um, in, in a very real way um, that, you know, I would love to hear your voice. Um, okay, so the, you know, beyond of beyond Black Friday means that we're going beyond the spectacle of consumer greed um, or retailer greed and consumer violence, 
because those two things are like kind of locked together in a exploitative way. Um, to think about some of the things surrounding Black Friday that are not going to be in, you know, the news story about people breaking down doors uh, to get into Walmart, um, but to think about air quality and wages and land use and all the things that are subtending logistics and, you know, underneath the supply chain. Um, okay, so thank you for uh, listening to my spiel. Um, I hope it won't be ungracious if I let the speakers each introduce themselves. Um, you already have their bios and then they can kind of pop out the relevant facts that uh, will lead into their comments. But, um, you know, do uh, with me warmly welcome um, Catherine Gudis, Ellen Reese, and Andrea Vidaure. And is it okay for me to share my screen now? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully, you can see it. There we go. Everybody see that screen? Yeah. Okay. Oh, awesome. Great. So I am Ellen Reese, um, and I uh, go by she, her pronouns, and I have also been at UCR for 21 years. <laughs> I think Dylan and I came into UCR the very same year. Um, so today I'm going to talk um, about this uh, book that I co-edited with Jake Alima Homed Wilson, um, who is a UCR alumnus, um, and unfortunately he could not make it today. Um, but I'm going to talk uh, mostly about the chapters focusing on the U.S. and our own region. Um, but I just wanted to point out that if you're interested in the global picture, other chapters do focus on what's happening in Europe and as well as India. Um, and I'm going to talk a, a bit about our introductory chapter, which was also co-authored with Julianne Allison from UCR as well. Um, so. The pandemic happened and Amazon's power and influence, which was already enormous, grew even more, right, in 2020. Um, by mid-2020, the corporation's market cap increased to $1.58 trillion, which surpassed Microsoft. Jeff Bezos was the first person in world history to amass a net worth of over $200 billion. And Amazon hired nearly 400,000 more essential workers since 2019, bringing Amazon's directly employed global workforce to over 1.2 million workers by September of 2020. And that's not even including the over 500,000 contracted delivery drivers that deliver Amazon packages, many of whom are delivering them in vans labeled as Amazon vans, but they're not directly employed by the company, right? They're often subcontracted or work, working as Amazon flex drivers. Um, and Amazon's profits, right, depend upon racial capitalism. Uh, Amazon, I think, is a particularly uh, good site for studying contemporary racial capitalism in the neoliberal era. Um, and if we borrow from Cedric Robinson's concept of racial capitalism, it highlights how capitalist accumulation depends upon white supremacy and racial violence. And I think we really get a sense of that when we look at who does what in Amazon, right? 71.4% of top executives and senior level Amazon employees are white, most of whom are men. Um, meanwhile, workers of color, especially black and Latinx workers, make up the most of Amazon's blue collar workforce. Um, and Amazon's own data calls them sort of laborers and helpers, which is a little beyond just warehouse workers. Um, if we look at those laborers and help, helpers, 68% of them are workers of color, of which 33% are black and 22% are Latino. Um, that's, these are national figures. Um, if we look in our own region, it's mostly Latino workers that are laboring in warehouses. Uh, so what do we mean by Amazon capitalism. Um, this is a term we use in this book and we're interrogating, our, our contributors are interrogating in this uh, volume. Um, and in part, we're, we're 
referring to the enormous rise in Amazon's power and wealth and its increasing influence in our global capitalist economy. Um, you know, and in some ways, this, this rise in power and influence, it's not so new, right? And, and it simply makes visible uh, and reflects the larger trends that have been happening for some time, for some decades in our global economy, such as the increasing influence of finance, capitalism, neoliberal politics, and corporate power, right? And even longer term problems associated with systemic racism and capitalist accumulation. But we also argue that Amazon capitalism sort of marks a turning point um, in our global capitalist system. Um, and Amazon has been promoting certain novel forms of capitalism that have been picked up and mimicked by other employers. Um, certainly, they're not the only ones doing this, but they're certainly a big player in, in terms of pushing forward these novel for, forms of capitalism that are associated with electronic technology that present new challenges for workers, communities, and the environment. Um, one of these is surveillance capitalism, right? And here we're borrowing a term by Shoshana Zuboff from her book. Um, and then the other phenomena is sort of one-click instant consumerism, right? So Shoshana Zoboff uses this term surveillance capitalism to refer to a new economic order that claims human experience is free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. And Amazon's technologies of surveillance not only monitor every action of its blue collar workforce in warehousing and delivery, but it also is surveilling customers every time we click that buy box. It's also, uh, surveilling people through ring home surveillance systems as well as through alexa and then we need to also consider amazon's one-click instant consumerism which amazon has really pushed forward in major ways which has led to the speed up of consumerism including expedited free shipping of consumer products that we now take for granted that we can click on a buy box and get that product within the same day. This represents a title shift in the global economy that's driven largely by finance capitalism. And even before the pandemic, monthly, about 200 million unique users were visiting amazon.com to purchase consumer products sold not only by Amazon, but also by a lot of third-party sellers, right? Contributing to the corporation's 440 million metric ton carbon footprint. And this drive to deliver goods cheaply by Amazon has encouraged it to become a leading logistics company. Um, it's increasingly relying on independent contractors ra rather than unionized drivers through uh, the US postal system, right? Or UPS to deliver its goods. The rise of Amazon's e-commerce business has also contributed to the decline in brick and mortar shops, including unionized grocery stores. And more and more deliveries mean more air pollution. It's something that is not surprising to those of us in inland Southern California. So in this edited volume, uh, we draw attention to the impacts that the rise of Amazon capitalism has for our cities and our local economies. Um, and the challenges it presents for blue collar warehouse workers, as well as delivery drivers, most of whom are workers of color, the grueling pace of work, their low pay, the precarious terms of their employment, they experience high injury rates, high turnover rates, it's a high churn model of employment, and there's risks of exposure to COVID-19, and there's been attacks on unions, right? And then we need to also consider the impacts and challenges Amazon capitalism presents for local businesses and unionized workers, right, including those in groceries and in delivery. The challenges it presents for our local democracy and the political voice of working class communities. We might just think for a minute about the bidding war among U.S. cities who are competing over getting Amazon's headquarters, their second headquarters located in their city, and they were offering millions of dollars of subsidies, right, to, to try to entice Amazon into their community and asking very little in return. Amazon also provides the technology for increased surveillance of both activists and immigrants. 
And then we need to also consider, and I think Andrea is going to talk quite a bit about the environmental impacts, right, of this phenomena, the increased traffic congestion, the air pollution in our communities. Uh, so a number of chapters, uh, we take a look at uh, uh, the experiences of warehouse workers and delivery drivers and their concerns. Um, these chapters were based on interviews with workers and uh, the chapters that I uh, authored or co-authored um, draw on interviews that were collected by UCR students. By, we had really awesome uh, team of uh, student researchers that uh, uh, collected interviews and helped out with this research. Um, and so what those interviews revealed was, you know, a grueling pace of work, a very high injury rates and turnover rates among warehouse workers. More than 90% of the Southern California warehouse workers interviewed, and these were from Riverside and San Bernardino counties, agreed that they suffered from pain and fatigue at the end of their work shifts. And under the pressure to work fast that's enforced through electronic surveillance, many warehouse workers, as well as delivery drivers, who are often subcontracted and misclassified, experience stress. They cannot work safely and they cannot use the restroom when needed. And these are pictures that, you know, were going uh, viral, right, of workers, you know, who, um, you know, have to urinate in bottles because they're worried that they can't make rate or they're not going to deliver the package on time. And Amazon's PR people were denying that this was a reality and the workers fought back by, by photographing, documenting, right, their piss bottles, right? So, um, yeah, so many uh, workers, you know, interviewed for my study and, and around the world, you know, find that they, they can't use the restroom when needed. Um, and then in chapter six, uh, we take a look at the experiences that many warehouse workers had with uh, racism, racialized xenophobia, sexism, sexual harassment. Most of these workers are men, but a growing number of them are women. Um, and then we also uh, talk about the um, sort of the runaround they get from the human resources. You know, if, if they actually uh, file a complaint, right, they had really inadequate responses. Um, so we talk about these problems, but we also talk about the resistance that's been growing. Um, one of my favorite chapters in this edited volume was uh, written by members of Amazonians United in, from Ch Chicagoland, um, and they wrote it collectively. Um, and so that's chapter 17. Um, and Amazonians United um, is a grassroots uh, worker-led organizations that form chapters across U.S. cities. Um, and so this particular chapter was focusing on uh, the work that they'd been doing in Chicago. Uh, and these workers had engaged in various courageous collective actions, including walkouts, and they've won uh, important victories in, in improving their working conditions, including be better access to clean drinking water, payments for when workers had to leave their shifts because of the lights going off or it was too hot or there just wasn't enough goods to deliver for the number of workers assigned to that shift. Um, they also got health and safety improvements, including during the pandemic. Um, and they fought for and won, not only for themselves, but across the nation, paid time off for part-time workers that were diagnosed with COVID-19. And um, this uh, was, initially only given to the full-time workers. But, you know, these workers, Amazonians uh, United said, no, it should go to all workers, right? And they won that fight. Um, so uh, what's been happening in Chicago and, and even regionally, uh, there has been growing resistance to Amazon. And this is happening not just in the U.S., but also transnationally. So there is an emergent global resistance movement um, and, you know, just as the power of in, and influence of Amazon capitalism is growing, so too is popular discontent with it and resistance. Um, and so we argue that Amazon provides a key site for worker organizing and for building alliances among workers across cities and nations, which they have been doing. Um, and this includes um, uh, workers in Europe, uh, some of whom have already unionized, right? Euro many European countries are, are more union friendly than here in the U.S. Um, but uh, some of the grassroots organi organized workers 
in Amazonians United have been working and coordinating with them, sometimes around Black Friday protests, uh, Cyber Monday protests, among other uh, times. Um, and, you know, Amazon not only provides a key site for building alliances across uh, cities and nations among workers, but also for building alliances across movements, including movements for economic and racial justice, for democracy, for anti-policing immigrant rights, and for environmental justice. And I think Andrea is going to be talking more about the San Bernardino Airport Coalition. So uh, I'll just flag that that I think that coalition is a good example of, of the way in which Amazon has provided a, a target uh, for building coalitions. And maybe we'll get back to this. Uh, <laughs> I'll stop sharing. Maybe we'll, we'll share this later on. But um, the San Bernardino Airport community is, is currently working together to uh, raise some money for mutual aid for the community. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I've been talking for a bit. Um, and I will turn it over uh, to my good colleague, Catherine Gudis. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And I'm, 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 I apologize to my students who had to look at me twice today. So hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, so I want to I want to riff a little bit on some of what both Susan said and a little bit of Ellen. I think I'm continuing a theme in which we're trying to sort of move between the tangible elements that are part of Amazon, part of the logistics industry and goods movement and its impacts in the inland region in particular, but then to also think about how challenging it is to wrap your mind around the scale and the scope of goods movement. And so I really love the way that we started with this because it is a jockeying back and forth. And I wanna riff a little bit on some of it um, by, by talking about where I'm coming from in terms of imagining the impacts of logistics, both on our region and more globally. I'm a public historian. What that means is that I'm very interested in doing research with other people that oftentimes connects the past to the present, and in particular tries to address the long histories of um, socially pressing issues today. And so among the projects that I've been working on are how we can possibly um, make sense of or help people engage in different ways with elements of infrastructure that are just so big, you, you really can't even tell what's going on, right? That it's so ubiquitous and so large that you, you kind of don't know it's right there in front of your face, right? Sort of hidden, hidden from view in a lot of senses. And so I've been working on different infrastructural issues around Southern California by focusing on different ways we might engage the built and natural environment to understand these really long histories of place and race and the ways we can understand the forces that have constructed these landscapes that are affecting us today. And so as part of these, a set of different projects, which all go into a book that I've been trying to write for a while that spans different public projects that are oftentimes very performative, where you go out into the spaces or you perform some of the histories that are being narrated. So my book is about those kinds of strategies of addressing social issues through public engagement that exceeds what we normally think of as heritage or cultural heritage or heritage conservation sites. So one of my chapters in this book relates to work that I've been doing for over 20 years with a performance group called Los Angeles Poverty Department, which has been documenting the lived experiences of people who live in Skid Row, who in turn create performances from those. And then they've been archiving that material for 35 years. So I've been working with them most recently to take those archives, make them a formal archive, which is quite unlike what we would normally experience, but then to also take some of that lived experience and that history and use it for public education tools. So I want to say that I first started about, mm, I would say when I first got to um, UCR, which was 2006, when I first realized from the freeway views that this was a place like no other in terms of the rates at which the logistics industry was taking over 
incredibly large land masses. And I originally was going to write a book because I was so inspired by that called To Market to Market, um, in which one chapter would be on trucking and one chapter would be on logistics. And what's interesting in looking back at that, which forms the basis for a few of my other chapters of, of this current project, in looking back at it, I realized, because the, the bio used for me was really old, and I looked and I realized when I was talking about that book, the phrase e-commerce really wasn't understandable to people, right? And so this has been something that for the last 15 years has really grown. And it's grown in terms of the ways in which we understand climate change and environmental justice through this same lens of the historical forces that have been at play for a very long time in constructing the places where we live and we circulate. And so one of my chapters in the book is also about a set of projects I've been trying to do around logistical land landscapes. Um, and I might show one slide at the very end that shows um, a mini performance of, of this enacting of a landscape which is surreal, that involves these dichotomies between wealth and poverty, between access to clean air and water and not. And in some ways, it's so unreal that it almost seems like a really bad joke if it wasn't for the fact that people live it right? Like, how can we imagine these things about Black Friday? I mean, that's ridic it's ridiculous, right? Violence associated at that level with shopping. So anyway, I embarked on a project with a group of about 22 other universities, issues-based organizations, and different community-based groups, including Andrea, who's going to be speaking a in a little while. Um, she and her colleague, Anthony um, Victoria Medens, were among the folks who I got to learn from and study with to try and understand stories of environmental justice um, that are affecting our region. So with students and with them, I was really lucky to work on a project that's a traveling exhibition that'll be coming to our area probably next year. And that also includes some sort of micro documentaries, short video clips. And what we started to realize as a group, as we looked through the region and tried to figure out how we could tell a national story through our lo the local examples, was that what we were looking at was something that certainly does, as Susan said, revolve around issues of flow. In fact, we originally called the project Flow as a way to get at issues of migration, immigration, the flow of air, the flow of bodies, the flow of, of capital. And we realized, like, like as Susan mentioned, that you know, rather than logistics being a, a mere management science of distribution, it's a global set of circulatory systems and that it encompasses all phases of the very long process of what she describes as from um, the ways in which bodies were carried as commodities in the hold of ships and orchestrated to be delivered as property. And that logistics as we imagine it today is not separate from that. It's a global set of circulatory systems that encompasses all phases of production from resource extraction to design, to manufacture, distribution, and then consumption, right? And that that might describe material flow, like goods, right? Which are made and assembled and circulated along concrete, along steel corridors and conveyances like ships and trains and trucks that go along you know, freeways. But that logistics is very much fully about the quest for dematerialization. In other words, dematerialization referring to a desire to undermine the physical facts of labor, the physical facts about the built in natural environment and the conditions of work, all with an aim to eliminate human time in favor of speed, to eliminate bodily presence in favor of automation for workers and algorithms for managers, and to do away with the materiality of human bodies and subjectivities, right? And so there's a wishful thinking about logistics that's certainly about the removal of workers' bodies and certainly about the container, the container ship, the very, as one uh, scholar puts it, the very coffin of remote labor power. But it's also about rendering invisible the obdurate materiality and impact of information systems, of data, what you don't see, like network servers and wires and cables, et cetera. 
Okay, all of this is what enables information and communications technologies that revolutionized logistics and just-in-time production, and that pretty much put the final nail in the coffin of America's domestic mass industrial production and reconfigured those capitalist social relations of power, which um, Ellen has spoken about so, so well. So data and its management is essentially how, and this is to my students of my class, how Walmart helped change a world that Amazon would continue to colonize. So this is the empire of logistics. It's a violent terrain, as others have said, and it does fit into the phrase inland empire, right? There, I mean, how did the area develop? It developed um, into this um, through this, right? Where British investors literally came as a tool of white settler colonialism, displacing and continuing to fortify their role in removing indigenous people from the land. And in fact, in the far distant background here is where um, members of San Manuel were originally were on land that then they were pushed aside for citrus groves and the water taken from them. And so we can see a lot of parallels in what I wanna call these circulatory systems of logistics that are tied part and parcel with that phrase that was the ch is the chapter for this traveling exhibition that we've worked on called the slow violence of the supply chain, which is a way to address that this stretching across time and space with military routes that are, um, you know, think again, Genghis Khan mobilizing troops across the Gobi, the military or origins of the internet with Vietnam era ARPANET, uh, which was the precursor to the web, those contemporary surveillance systems, all of these are stretching across time and space in an attritional lethality of what Rob Nixon, the scholar, identifies as slow violence and Deborah Cohen calls the deadly life of logistics. And so we wanted to use that idea to think about these founding moments of logistics and also the ways in which there are so many parallels of the ship's hold to then the boxcar, to then the prison itself, right? All of these warehousing elements in which bodies are oftentimes contained in a violent way. So we wanted to be able to look at all of this as these roots of logistical um, capitalism. We also wanted to point really explicitly to the fact that the violence is to the land and the people upon it. It is about the ways in which the landscape was colonized. It is about the ways in which the continued worker exploitation has additionally sought again that dematerialization in trying to render laborers invisible themselves. This is a 2009 kind of famous uh, demonstration that blocked the, the street on the way to Schneider Logistics to choke the supply chain. And I want you to look out for the phrase, choke the supply chain because right now at the ports of LA and Long Beach, as those hundred ships are hovering in the water and we see it in, in aerial views, people are talking about how the supply chain is choked. Whereas as, 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 as Ellen and her colleagues wrote about in a previous book, um, choking the supply chain is also a tool of labor advocacy to try to advocate for rights. So we are at a prime moment to try and advocate for rights, to make visual the fact that this is not new, that these um, empire, the empire of logistics was the citrus empire. Um, and that when we think about violence, we can think about the entire route across the supply chain, whether it's in West Long Beach, where those children at the Hudson Elementary School are playing in the shadow of the fumes that choke them in turn along a diesel death corridor, or whether you're at Nunez Park in San Bernardino, where there's violence incurred against the bodies of those who are playing on the field, or when we think about the violence of incarceration during World War II, when the Army Supply Depot first developed in San Bernardino, as scholar Brinda Sarathi points out in, um, in her literature describing Mira Loma, the epicenter in the Riverside County of the um, supply depots that has its origins during World War II, when the US Army was mobilizing to create an entire new city and remove people from LA to incarcerate 
incarcerate them at Manzanar. This was actually, and it's still the building right here, which is called the um, Miraloma Space Center, where the supplies were organized and logistically sent out to Manzanar to feed the people there and also to train the military out in the desert. And yet today we see that um, sort of the American dream embodied in the single family house where right over the back fence is the, are the distribution warehouses affecting the quality of, the, of life of the primarily communities of color who have settled there. So I just wanted to point out that oftentimes we go through these landscapes and don't have this kind of view. This is a view of the prologious um, warehouses that um, conquered land that ought to have been public from the former um, San Bernardino Norton Air Base and instead was developed for private interests. We were sold out by our politicians as this land was redeployed from being citrus landscapes to military landscapes to now logistics landscapes. You can still see the palm trees lining the way and you see a few remnants of citrus. Those are no longer there today. Um, but note that we see this long transformation simply in this journey that we might not notice when you, for instance, are late for school, where one of my students said, yeah, the supply chain made me late for, for, for class, because in, in fact, as we try to journey through the region, we are blocked in various forms of our journeys too. So I want to leave it here so that um, Andrea can talk about the many different ways in which she's been able to teach me and many others about how we can agitate and form coalitions together to try to push back against these specific forms of violence that are affecting not only the land and the people, but the ways in which we can see a better future for the next generation in the area as a continuation of this long, slow violence that many people are pushing up against. Thanks. And I'll pass it to you, Andrea. Thank you so much. That was, that was amazing. And um... Yeah, uh, so much from both of you, uh, or all three of you, um, have really helped to set the the context of, of what we're talking about today on Black Friday. Um, and so uh, just really quickly, you know, before I, I kind of go into uh, the People's Collective and some of the fights that we've been involved in, I just, I do want to ground us because we did hear a lot of analysis and a lot of context of, of what Black Friday is. Um, but I, I just want to ground it in you know, Black Friday to a lot of working class families uh, in the region and, you know, throughout the country is, you know, finally sometimes a day off uh, when people are so heavily overworked. Uh, a lot of our communities here in the, in, the, in the empire, because logistics has been the only option for many uh, to fall into, um, you know, works them to the bone up until these types of days. And so it, it does become, it almost, it's, it's almost as if capitalism forces Black Friday to even be more of an option for them or Cyber Monday to be more of an option for them because they are so overworked. So in a way that how the way that capitalism and, and Amazon capitalism both perpetuates and then tries to respond and and tries to like be there for for workers that are churned out, I think is really important. Um, I also think it's important to show the way that like um, you know, capitalism has created Black Friday to be a day where you can get cheap things, especially when you're underpaid or you're working multiple jobs like that. It almost it makes itself a necessity. It makes itself it makes itself dependent to, to many of us, um, because where, where else are we going to get uh, these types of things when we're already spending so much money on on rent? um on gifts etc so you know the way uh, you know black friday has become this cultural phenomenon um but unfortunately it's it's still this thing that a lot of our communities do look at because of, of the ways that everything else has has forced us to and you know although it, you know we heard the ways that uh, warehouse work and trucking work is exploitative you know it is what so many of our families doing and in, including most of mine um, and although it churns their bodies out until they physically cannot perform what's beneficial to the company, um, there's really no other options that have been left for folks that are, you know, migrants who maybe have not gotten more than a, college, a high school degree. Uh, many of the people working in warehouses right now were probably poached or recruited uh, at their local high schools because that's the new tactic. They're about they're in there almost as strong as the military is right now. Um, 
and especially for our non-English speakers, right? This has this is a good place, right? So our, our social conditions, the way they they drive um, those parts of our communities that that are already marginalized into a place to be uh, further marginalized. And of course, in in COVID nineteen, when so many um, employment options were struck down, uh, you know, warehouse work became yet again a, another option. And I, I do want to note this because uh, I have uh, so many critiques on our systems of logistics and our supply chain, uh, but I do want to note that for a lot of our communities, uh, a lot of our uh, uh, disability community, right, um, the benefits of being able to have some types of systems that can get us our needs met um, has become really beneficial to them, right? And so how do we uh, are able to both meet the needs of all of the people in our community while not doing it in a way that exploits and hurts both our people and our communities, I think is a is an important conversation to always have when we're talking about the goods movement and the supply chain. Um, but yeah, so so my name is Andrea, I use she, her pronouns. I live on, on occupied uh, lands, uh, on the occupied lands of the Tongva people. Um, I'm with a, an organization called the People's Collective for Environmental Justice, where, uh, we're a collective of uh, community members and workers that all grow, have grown up or live or work in the Inland Empire. And we've been impacted by the growing supply chain in our backyards. Um, and all of that, because of the context we've been talking about today and, and a lot of the history we've been able to teach ourselves about what, it's not just a warehouse, it is so much more than that. It's, a, it's yet another way of keeping our communities locked down. Uh, because of all the things that we've been able to learn over the years, you know, we find it really, we created this collective to, uh, because we found it necessary to be able to, for our existence and for our quality of life, be able to organize and challenge it at every step of the way. Um, and so I, I'm glad um, both Catherine and Ellen talked about, um, you know, the history of the supply chain and the way that it is uh, inherently racist and the way that we're seeing it grow today just doubles down on on the histories of, of racism that it has. And so when people are saying, you know, about the supply chain uh, being congested or, you know, there's a chokehold or it's broken up um, or it's unsustainable right now, I, I would I love to just bring up the fact that the supply chain was always made to be unsustainable. The supply chain was always made to benefit only certain people and not benefit others. And that's what, and we really are seeing it today. And um, so in the Inland Empire, we have about, 40% of the nation's stuff is going through the ports of LA and Long Beach, and then it goes into our communities of the Inland Empire and then out to the rest of the country. And having 40% of the nation's stuff being dependent on our one little part of the country is already unsustainable as it is. Um, but it also proves a great power, right? Because if anything goes down here, the entire country is, is, um, is affected by it. Um, but just to show that really, um, it, it's not like we made a supply chain to meet everybody's needs. We made a supply chain that really just hoards money, hoards capital, hoards power at the expense of others. And so we, we really see it here with the millions of square feet of warehousing that are all over the Inland Empire that continue to grow. Um, if you're from the region or have driven in the region, you know that we have like three or four major freeways. All of those freeways are carrying about 20,000 diesel trucks every single day. Um, and in certain communities, Communities. Uh, if you go outside and count uh, how many diesel trucks or big rigs are going in front of your house or your park or your community center, it can be up to a thousand trucks or more at a time. Uh, some of these main streets that you would, you know, that have a school next to them, a park next to them, sometimes are getting up to 11,000 trucks a day. And, and this is not a freeway, this is just a street. Uh, because of the way that we've developed the Inland Empire in a way that benefits corporations, that benefits uh, wealthy people, um, and you know extracts what what's here right now. Um, and so, you know, our I got involved in this fight because I saw the way that so much of our land in our communities was being rezoned. So, uh, in the Inland Empire, we have a lot of open lots, and we have a lot of lots where not a lot is going on. And over the past five to ten years, what we've noticed is that uh, corporations, developers have come in. They've bought the lots. Maybe twenty years ago, maybe before some of the kids in the high schools next to them were even born yet. And they held them off up until right now where it's become one of the biggest ways to get a profit um, 
from from land out here in the Inland Empire. And so um, there have been so many regions that not only are being used up for warehousing now, where you can't tell if you're an industrial community or residential community, but we're also seeing the mass displacement of communities because at this point, capital and making money and benefiting these at the at the exact at the um, expense of the people living here has has triumphed. So there's um, there's this entire area of over 200 homes in Bloomington right now that is. Uh, this, the county of San Bernardino is saying that we are going to zone them all industrial without them even having a choice in it. So their home that they may have lived there for however long, or if they're a renter in the area, which we do have a lot of renters in our community, will have no say on, on the zoning of their land. So the way that the county systemically comes in and changes the future of that community. And so there's mass displacement, not only happening in Bloomington, but all over the Inland Empire um, so that warehousing can come in and people being paid off to be able to leave, but not being able to go, go anywhere else, right? Um, there's places of recreation that have been lost, right? Uh, not to say that Scandia was, you know, you know, Disneyland or anything like that, but you know, we we saw we we do we are seeing parks close down, amusement parks close down, things that are can even be in a way a cultural significance for people growing up and living in the Inland Empire being lost to warehousing. So again, it goes back to like what is who's deciding for our region. Uh, what are they deciding for and what do we get? Are, are we just merely here to work as robots, right? Are we merely here just to work these, these warehouses and not have all the other things that make us thrive? And so that has been something that we've been fighting against. And something else we've been trying to fight against too is the fact that um, our counties and our cities, with, along with these developers, are coming in and selling this idea of, hey, if we bring in these warehouses to your communities, you're going to get sidewalks, you're going to get a sewage system, and hey, you're going to get a sheriff. I can't tell you how many of these warehouses have promised sheriffs in the community when that's not what the community is asking for at all. And also, with like, I'm, I haven't seen seven sheriffs in the community, but I'm sure a bunch of money is being funneled into into the the police department because of these types of projects um and it makes sense right because anytime there is resistance we see the way that you know um police and stuff are armed and ready to protect property um instead of community and so all of these things have have kind of come together um F, that has created right this movement locally to to fight against it and um you know if you five years ago you know there were definitely certain communities fight there have been communities fighting for the last 20 years but over the past five years i can say we've really seen an uptick in the way different communities all across the inland empire have fought against it really close to uc riverside is the world logistics center which is in moreno valley if you guys know if you guys are at ucr and you need to go to like i don't know buffalo wild wings or like walmart in moval right um you know you know that 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 interchange is in incredibly trafficked already and it is it is almost impossible to leave moreno valley at certain times of the day out more into the west valley um that project was going to bring fourteen thousand trucks a day into and out of that community completely taking time away from the residents that live there um on their daily commute or whatever they want to do um and so um yeah, that's that's all to say. So there was a big fight there that went on. There's big fights all over uh, Bloomington. Fontana right now has been making a lot of noise because they brought in about 20 warehouses near three schools, uh, Bloomington, Harupa Valley, um, et cetera. And, and one of the ones I want to talk about is is the fight that we're having in San Bernardino right now, because I think it's it's important um, to have that conversation. Um, and really, um, our you know, today we've been able to talk about all the ways that logistics affects our quality of life and what it means but um the thing that we focus on day to day is really the health impacts because you can't yeah 14,000 trucks um you know 20,000 trucks on these freeways a day yeah it, it's a big nuisance right but really what it's doing to our bodies that we can't see is is really the angle in which we come at this too because in you know in the inland empire san Bernardino riverside we have some of the highest levels of ozone pollution in the country um depending on what zip codes you live in you mo you most likely have a higher rate of um you know passing away at an earlier age having asthma having chronic lung disease and i can't tell you too many uh families that have had to lose people in their families too soon because of where they have lived um and and granted, right, we, we have a rail, we have two of the major rail lines here, BNSF and UP. We have major airports that are continuing to grow every day. And on top of that, we've gone in the incoming boom of e-commerce. Um, all of that culminated is 
um, layering, you know, people that live here every single day with something that they cannot control, right? They're the fu their future isn't in their hands, depending on, on where they are and where, what they're breathing in. And so, although the fight, you know, and the climate fight has been, hey, let's electrify everything. Uh, really, if we electrify everything, we're not gonna get to the root of the problem, which is uh, communities shouldn't be overburdened um, or have to shoulder the cost for everybody else to, to get their needs met, right? This type of system of sacrifice, uh, which has been the history of this country is to sacrifice a certain population for the benefit of others. Um, is something that we can't continue here. Um, and um, in some of the research that, you know, we've been able to do and, and research on with Amazon and stuff like that, you know, the, the people that are buying the most from Amazon are not the people that live here, right? The people that are shopping the most, consuming the most are not the people that have to shoulder the cost. And so that's uh, something really important to us. And so um, just to end it with this fight that we had in San Bernardino um, about a couple of years ago, three years ago, actually, um, you know, Amazon is the largest employer in the Inland Empire. They have the largest amount of warehouses here in the in the Inland Empire than anywhere else in the country. Uh, they wanted to grow their Amazon Air footprint because they said to have same day shipping or next day shipping, we're going to have to put things through air cargo flight. And they've already done this in several other parts of the country, um, but they wanted their West Coast one and they wanted to do it at the San Bernardino International Airport, which used to be the Norton Air Force Base, which was supposed to be public land, but the cities, uh, the cities all sold it off to a private developer who said, hey, let's open the doors for Amazon to come in. This was all hidden behind closed doors as they usually do. The notification that they were coming in was in a newspaper. You know, nobody reads the newspaper like, like that, right, anymore. Um, you know, and so everything was hidden underneath. And, and granted, this was also in a place where the EPA said that there was still toxic, um, there was still toxic land underneath because of the military operations that have happened there. So they wanted to bring in yet another polluter to come sit on land that was already polluted in zip codes that are some of the most polluted and the most impoverished um, in the region. And so um, a lot of our groups had been fighting warehouses just one by one. And we were a, we came together with other community groups, faith-based leaders, right? Getting the churches involved, um, Black-led organizations, um, uh, labor unions, uh, some labor unions, um, mainstream environmental groups, just trying to get resource all of the allies that we had here, including the academics, um, trying to get everybody together so that we could take on a fight like this. And instead of saying, no, we don't want the project, we fought, hey, Amazon, come sit at the table with the community, come negotiate with the community. If you're gonna come in here, um, the community has certain standards that they want from you if you're gonna be coming in to land that should have, that is public um, and for us to set the stage there. And, uh, you know, because, it was so late in the game um, because they had hit it so well. We had very little like legal opportunities to enter into the fight. And the fight grew with like engaging so many members in our community and being able to go door to door, talk to so many people about what are their lived conditions. We met so many people that have been churned out of Amazon. Like so many people, We anytime we go, we know someone has worked there, but most people don't stay there because the turnover rate is so high. Um, and uh, we were able to just create, right, this, this localized movement in San Bernardino about what was happening and uh, bring it up to the levels of the state where the attorney general was able to come in and weigh in on the project. Um, and it led to, you know, physical resistance as well. You know, on two, three years ago, I guess now, Black Friday, three years ago, uh, community members were ready to take on a physical fight, a physical demonstration, and they were able to... Um, do a community picket in support of the workers that were inside of the Amazon facility. Uh, and we were able to slow down trucks for almost 24 hours, right? Uh, completing an entire picket of stopping trucks um, on both sides of the freeway, trying to, you know, trying to choke, choke Amazon's line on one of their most important days, which was Cyber Monday, um, as, a, as a way to show uh, community force um, that we can be the ones to, to show you that you do need to slow down for our community. You do need to come and sit down and listen to the community. Um, that was a, that one was a, an amazing experience because 
um, both it supported workers on the inside, but also it was the community coming out and saying that, you know, workers are part of our communities and, and communities are workers. So um, this fight isn't just, it, this fight is about um, that type of solidarity. And so um, that project now was in litigation for about two years because the airport decided to lie about the impacts that the airport was going to have, that Amazon was going to have on the community. And just a couple days ago, we got the result from the Ninth Circuit, which shouldn't be surprising because it's very hard to rely on the state to uphold um, any types of protections for communities, especially when it's environmental. And the judges had decided that uh, Amazon was not wrong in saying that they had they were going to bring no significant impact into the community. And so that's, you know, that's just that prolonged fight. And I think if we stop now, there's uh, that's a lot of momentum loss. So we're just going to keep going and appeal that decision, hopefully, and, and continue to fight that on that front that uh, Amazon shouldn't lie about uh, the impacts that they're going to have in the community. Um, so, yeah, that is uh, kind of uh, some of the, the local fights that we've been getting into. Um, and that thankfully is not the only ones, right? Uh, there has been a spur of moratoriums that residents have pushed themselves. So moratoriums means a pause on, on, on development. Colton has been able to be successful, Harupa Valley. Um, Rialto, I think, is considering it. And so just to show that, right, this, this ongoing movement is very much alive in, in our communities and, you know, it's, it needs to continue to be to be pushed, especially on days like this. So I'll close it out here and I'll pass it back to Susan. Oh, thank you so much, Andrea, um, for those comments and that account and for your activism. And, um, and thank you to Ellen and Kathy as well um, for your presentations and for the public advocacy that you've done too. Um, at this point, uh, I'd love for there to be questions from those of you who have been listening. And um, I invite you either to throw those questions into the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask. And I'll um, create a few moments here uh, for you to do that. And if no one jumps in, I will kick off some questions. I mean, one thing uh, that we can perhaps talk about while people are formulating their thoughts and questions is, um, you know, the question of uh, choking and resisting and slowing down and insisting on um, Andrea, as you put it so beautifully, you know, the space and the time for community. Um, how to do that, uh, you know, it seems to me that there is like the local, which, you know, you just described, like, you know, all the cities you just mentioned, this region. Um, and then also in Ellen, in your presentation, you talked about um, the way that as Amazon gets bigger and more networked and connected throughout the world, that there can be possibilities for more networked and connected resistances to it. You know, like for example, um, I think maybe it was two years ago, 2019, um, there was like an international effort on Black Friday that was directed against Amazon in cities all over the world where Amazon is. Um, and so I guess I, I sort of have, I don't know, maybe it's a big unanswerable question, but, um, and it's not like which is better or anything, but like, you know, how can we leverage, you know, can we connect like uh, the efforts at San Bernardino Airport in those communities to other parts of the world? Like, is, is that possible or does it come from, like, where does it come from and how do we nurture it if we wanted to do that? Uh, you know, I'll jump in for a second. Um, so I think through some of this work, um, both national and international solidarity has been really key and important. Um, there was an opportunity that we had. So there, there are tech workers at Amazon that are organizing themselves around climate change, saying that they need to, they want to tell their employer as workers themselves that the company needs to do better on climate change. And over the years, they've been able to really narrow 
narrowed down from climate change to environmental justice that like, wait a minute, there's also this veil that like, not only are they like a climate culprit, but they also have everyday um, impacts on, on communities. And so they were, they held a, um, I remember they were very connected to the workers out in like Europe that were also um, striking warehouse workers. And so I, th I think that that solidarity among different uh, parts of Amazon is really important from tech workers to warehouse workers and vice versa. Um, but then also like the cross sharing about what's going on. So most recently um, we heard about how in South Africa, Amazon is not only trying to build, I think like a headquarters or like a main building out there, but they're trying to do it on areas that would control like certain water rights into South Africa. And so that, that intersection of like uh, their impact on the environment and then also their control um, I think it's really important. And so that that type of solidarity among like sharing, um, you know, strategies and sharing solidarity and just sharing that it's happening, I think has been important to, to leverage. Um, and then I put in the chat this article about how, you know, 20 countries are planning to strike Amazon. Um, workers are planning to strike Amazon on Black Friday. Um, you know, to then again, remind the, the power that they have, that, that they, they make the they make that company run, not not vice versa. Yeah, and I, I think those um, uh, coordinated days of strike, yeah, which often uh, come in Black Friday, Cyber Monday, also on Prime Day. Um, yeah, they're, they um, are uh, built through, you know, transnational coalitions that have been growing for a number of years, you know, and Amazon workers getting together um, and, and talking to each other, uh, sharing stories, strategizing and, and coordinating. Um, and yeah, it, 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 there is a real gra grassroots effort to sort of build, build alliances, uh, you know, across countries, you know, realizing that, you know, um, some countries like labor laws are just different than others, right? But um, but then finding, you know, there's a lot of, of parallels in the working conditions, no matter what the context and Amazon tries to, you know, exploit whatever nation's laws, you know, as, as much as they can, right? And in exploiting workers and, you know, sometimes moving, you know, warehouses from one nation to another, right? Is a way to also, you know, find ways to, to minimize labor costs and so on. So, you know, uh, th those transnational alliances and alliances across cities too, right, become, become really, really important, I think, in, in building the resistance. Um, but I think, you know, there's still, you know, events happening, uh, you know, some of it's, you know, walkouts, some of it's strikes, some of it's also building and educating too, you know, and, and educating more and more workers, not only within warehouses, but also in the larger logistics industry as well. You know, I know like last year, um, the Teamsters uh, Union, which is also uh, investing more money in organizing uh, am around Amazon, um, you know, put on an event to, to try to sort of educate you know, truck drivers about, you know, how is this impacting you? <laughs> you know, it's not just, this is not just an issue in the warehouses, but it's also, you know, an issue that, you know, it's going to impact more and more of us, right, and impact truck drivers as well. Um, and, you know, and I think that kind of uh, educating, organizing, you know, I so it, I think there's many different forms that it's taking. And I think in, in San Bernardino, the airport communities uh, uh, group is now fundraising, I think, uh, to provide some community care is maybe a, providing an alternative, you know, like how do you push back? Maybe it's also to, to create an alternative. So, so this is- Are you looking yeah. at it? <laughs> oh, great, awesome. So this is this flyer um, with, you know, a, a group of, uh, community and labor activists, um, and hoping um, some of you can join us in this effort um, to provide some some uh, community care uh, to people in San Bernardino. Um, so, um, and we're raising money for for tents and socks. Socks, and I don't know if Andrea wants to say more more about this. Yeah, yeah. This is something actually we did last year because. Um, 
the residents, although, you know, the residents spend a lot of time kind of trying to figure out how to organize in their communities, uh, which is a lot of like canvassing, getting people like involved, um, like educated and organizing. Something that, you know, we run into is, is the fact that like so many people's needs are not met in the community, even with one of the richest companies in the world housed out of San Bernardino. The the fact that so many people's needs are not met and they're unfortunately out in the streets, they're living, you know, outside, there's uh, there's just food instability, housing instability, et cetera. Um, we think as a way to combat that is like, how do we not create a dependency on capitalism? How do we create like interdependency? And so um, not that we wanna support a, a mutual aid group in, in San Bernardino that has been every single weekend trying to get needs met for folks um, together. Uh, we're gonna fundraise this year and, and donate it to them so that they can get you know tents and socks out to folks that are living in our community. So um, yeah, if that, and this is a byproduct of all the things we talked about today is the fact that so many people are uh, living unhoused and with insecurity. So yeah, yeah. if you guys can help, uh, you know, much appreciated. We have a, we have a higher goal this year than we did last year. So. Yeah. So I, I want to just say that part of what we're looking at in this flyer is also a really, um, a, a real a shifting tide, I think, um, in terms of the ways in which coalitional politics have been developing in relationship to this. Because I'm thinking about when Edna Bonachit's book was out and the way the discussions around it were around labor issues and around the impact of, of goods movement, but not necessarily the same integration. And I'm thinking about when the book came out, there were some I think it was my first year at UCR, and there were some conversations around it. And I, I feel like in the intervening time, there's been a lot more, and I think the San Bernardino airport communities is emblematic of this, a lot more of bringing together labor, environmental justice, youth, and seeing these as interrelated so that labor isn't separate from the ways in which we would think about environmental justice. The forms of labor you do are not separate from it. The construction of the warehouses themselves, or as my, there, um, someone who's on the line here who um, also participated with San Bernardino Airport Coalitions, and I had, um, had interviewed um, uh, a Native American um, man who talked about the ways in which the warehouses are this permanent intervention on the landscape that not only doesn't allow the water to seep into the ground, but that will displace all of us because when they're finished with it, it will be this empty hulking shell in the way that we see um, mass industrial remains and the ways that it, they affected places like Detroit at a different moment, right? That we, that people aren't looking towards a longer future that Im involves all of us in this inter interwoven way. And so I feel like some of the issues around the mutual aid movements are also around recognizing um, that, you know, we can all attend to humanity, even when we're not sure about how to intervene in the global supply chain, because that does oftentimes feel too large to possibly, um, uh, you know, somehow come up with solutions to, although I think that several of them have been mentioned here. Yeah, yeah thank you, all three. Um, uh, to go to the chat, Noah asks a question, could expansion and improvement in rail transportation and infrastructure help alleviate the negative impacts in road-based transportation? And if I can piggyback onto your question, Noah, if anyone wants to comment on the recently almost pa passed uh, infrastructure bill at the federal level, um, that's a, related to this question about infrastructure and logistics. Yeah, um, I'll jump in. So yeah, rail infrastructure could be like a really great way of getting so many trucks off the road and onto communities. I think the problem is that our railroads here are controlled by a monopoly, one of the oldest standing monopolies, uh, which is uh, BNSF and Un Union Pacific. And they are solely interested in kind of keeping their model, even though across the world, other countries are 
putting overhead catenary lines, electrifying their rails so that it's not running on coal or diesel anymore. And unfortunately, where we find the cancer clusters the most in some of the health studies are closest to the rail yards because you're talking about thousands of locomotives are in that area. Many of them will idle right outside of homes that are placed right next to them. And so I think that rail is a really important option, just not the way that it's done now. I think if we were able to force them to put overhead catenary and modernize, even if it's not profitable, then it would be um, a really good move to go. And we are, unfortunately, the infrastructure bill, I think, did not put enough money on putting overhead catenary lines, because I don't think that's the direction they're trying to go in. But uh, there was money for electrifying other parts of it, which I think are important, because there's a lot of risk reduction um, that needs to be done at these places. Um, but because it's a federal issue and literally rail yards are protected by the constitution, uh, we find it we find it really hard to try to get any government agency to regulate them. But there is a there is a policy that the, our local air district has to do on rail, and that has been one of our like inflection points that we've been trying to push this idea of like the rail yards need to be owned by community and they need to be modernized and put overhead lines so that we can create a more efficient system because putting everything on trucks across the country is just not not going to work but i'll pass it to Catherine and ellen i just want to call attention to the fact that the expansion of the um the intermodal yards is a huge issue also and that i agree with everything andrea that i didn't know um half of what you were talking about in terms of i didn't i didn't realize that um that we could have had right those lines in the infrastructure bill but didn't right i didn't even i didn't even think about that as an option that's the thing it's very difficult within our existing system to imagine the other possibilities, which is partly why we all gather in the way we are here, or we join other kinds of community meetings to try to expand our perspective on it. And so I, I guess I wanted to mention two things. One is that I feel like um, the problem right now is that at, there needs to be expansion of the of the rail yards in order to accommodate the increased use of the trains. And that's causing an incredible wave of displacement among people who are already incredibly precarious in terms of um, where they're living, because those aren't the very the very helpful um, neighborhoods, particularly, um, and also because they are being displaced, and that's adding to the whole shift in the valuation of land in the area, such that one will need to to move further and further east, where there's additional expansion of new highways and distribution warehouses. So it, there, there's, a, you know, there's something here that just spells out this larger, these larger patterns of displacement that are, are really a huge concern, right? Because we, we're, we're used to people saying, well, it's about gentrification. And in this case, we're talking about the, the ways in which the value of the land has shifted and that it's a combination of forces, but that include the ways that for many years, the area was seen as cheaper than dirt, right? That the dirt was really had no value. So we ought to put as many warehouses as we can because then we'd have jobs and then people would have a better living and then we could build more houses. And now we're in this, um, in this conundrum of those very warehouses that were supposed to be promising jobs now booting people out of their homes and the value of the land increasing so that just moving isn't as easy as it might've been. And so the, the rail yard expansion projects in different parts of the whole supply chain from the, at least in Southern California, you know, really are posing huge challenges as Andrea had said in the beginning about, um, you know, green space being removed in the face of needing it desperately or parks and other homes and communities being, being um, you know, um, yeah, obliterated um, in this new wave of expansion. Thank you. Um, let me create a pause and ask if any of our listeners want to ask a question in the chat or verbally. You can go ahead and unmute and ask. Yes, someone's raising their hand. Uh, Greg, please go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, this is phenomenal work, everybody, and I really want to appreciate you all for uh, putting this together. I'm a 40-year uh, resident, um, native of the Inland Empire, um, with just a brief time away um, for military service. But um, 
I've seen the IE sort of uh, evolve to what it is today as a warehouse economy and culture. And, you know, I come from very humble beginnings. And um, so, you know, I, I would like to, I would like to just ask, you know, what do you say to the, to the local resistance of, of, the, of the work that you're doing and that, yes, this, the, the inland, the, the warehouses are creating jobs and we're very low income and we need this money. Like, what do you say to those folks? And, and, and also, what can we do? Um, I live out in Hemet. I, I've lived all over the Inland Empire, from Riverside in Ontario to Ukaipa, um, Hemet, and, and the like. So, so I kind of have a good feel of the entire area. Where I live, um, you know, it, we, we have um, a city government um, who sort of uh, not romanticizes over, over the warehouse, but they would like to, to entertain more, more opportunities to, to perhaps create them here but there isn't a whole lot of interest in it because of our location central uh, um, uh, on the peripherals of two major highways we're kind of in this far off valley i guess this valley away from the inland empire valley but anyway um do you, is there any material that we can use is there anything that's you know aggregated that we can go to our city council meetings and, and use to present to them thank you Thank, thank you so much. And yeah, I totally agree with you. You know, uh, warehouse work is dignified work and, and that's not what we're saying at all. I just think it's the way that it's done right now is, is what's so terrible about it. Um, and then the, just the magnitude of it in, in this one specific spot. Um, but I, I will say that we do have some resources online. I mean, I'm even thinking of the zine that uh, your student created, right? Um, for, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post that actually if I can find it in short order. Yeah, but but we do need more of that. And honestly, following some of these uh, these community pages on social media sometimes is really helpful helpful too. Um, but I think something that most recently I've been using um, in conversation because uh, as I mentioned earlier, right when they come in, they offer sewage, they offer sidewalks, they offer things that literally infrastructure that cities do not have, so that makes it almost feel like that much more needed. Um, but then we kind of, I, I started looking into the budgets and what budgets are spent on, and at least in the city of San Bernardino, over 60, 60 like 1% of the budget is used on police. That's like over half of the budget is used. I think it's one of the largest uh, usage or of budgets to, to police departments than any other country. I mean, the, than any other county in, in the country. Um, and so it's, it's kind of digging into like, where is money being used? Why can't you provide these basic necessities to, to people already? Like, kind of trying to to use that because Greg we've we've uh, been able to find uh, professors that have done economic studies and, and shown that like this is not a job that's going to give you a home one day it's not going to create generational wealth it's not it's you know it's short term you know uh, benefit not long term um, and those just roll over the past roll over the heads of decision makers so some we've been looking into other angles which this is the one I've been looking into right now uh, but yeah I think um I'm going to put some pages down that you could follow that I think sometimes do a lot of pop ed on this too. And I wanted to say, I'm glad you raised that issue and that question, you know, and I think, you know, part of some of the political support for more and more warehouses is this idea that we need the jobs and certainly we need the jobs, but then I think we need to also think about the quality of the jobs and, and do we only, only need warehouse jobs, right? When, you know, when there's so many people that need home health care, child care, even in our own campus, right? How many student parents need need child care, you know, for example, you know, like, and, and you know, uh, so thinking about the other needs, you know, in our economy that are not being met, maybe, you know, that where the jobs could get created. And then I think also there is a big issue about um, improving the jobs, you know, for warehouse workers. And, you know, recently there has been um, the passage of AB 701, I don't know if people have heard about this, um, but basically um, it gives warehouse workers the right to find out and ask questions about their work rates that are demanded of them um, that are often uh, electronically surveilled to make sure they make rate. You know, often these rates are really unreasonable, right? And, and so this law also gives warehouse workers the right to um, or the protection against being retaliated um, if they um, file a complaint about the high rates 
that they, they're expected to work under if those rates lead them to violate labor laws or, or create unsafe um, working conditions, right? The fact that Amazon has an injury rate that's double what it what we find for the warehouse industry as a whole is just horrible, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there's obviously huge health and safety issues at stake. So, you know, I think we need the jobs, but we also don't need jobs that are going to, you know, kill people, injure them, permanent injuries. And some of the interviews collected um, by UCR students for this book um, really document like the injuries that people have suffered, including, you know, permanent hearing losses or uh, injuries to their back that are permanent and, and so on. So I think um, definitely we need jobs, but we need quality jobs. And we also need to think about what kinds of uh, other needs we have in our economy that are not being met. Um, Ellen, I completely agree. And that also ties back into the notion that military jobs are becoming civilian logistics jobs um, with the same kind of danger to life and limb and health um, that one would have expected in the military. Um, we're, we're up against our end point, but uh, there was another question from Yvonne. So uh, Yvonne, if you'd like to ask your question, let's make that the one that we'll finish with. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, I, I did actually, Ellen kind of answered it because I, I had a question for you, Ellen, because I'm reading your books right now. And my question was, how, how do we see ourselves out of this? Because of these are most of the jobs in the area and nobody in this area, or not nobody, but the majority of the folks will never get out of long-term poverty um, if this is all we have. So how do we, how do we get out of this? And, the, and that's a, a question that, you know, I think we, we all need to ask ourselves and, and, you know, work together on, I think, you know, I, I think there's, you know, I think certainly we need better quality jobs. Um, we need a more sustainable economy. Um, we need something more than just another warehouse, right, being built um, in, in our economy. And, but I think the solutions are, you know, are going to come collectively. Um, so I'm really, really glad that we had this conversation tonight. And thank you, Susan, for bringing us together to think about these issues together and work together. And, you know, hopefully new connections are, are um, being made tonight and, and or revived too. And Yvonne, it's so good to see you here tonight, I have to say. So, um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, so I think if there are solutions to that, that problem, I think they're going to come collectively. So thank, thanks so much for, for asking that. And I don't have the complete answer, I think. <laughs> I think, I think hopefully we can work together on it, though. Um, thank you both. Did anyone else want to chime in on that? Um, I think it, it speaks to the integration of movements, um, Kathy, that you were talking about, that because environmental justice and um, racial justice and economic justice, all these things are, you know, logistics has a way of showing how those are facets of, of the same system. And so if you are working in one of those areas, you're helping the others in a way. Um, and Dylan, you just pointed that out in the chat, the connections to defunding the police coming out of Andrea, your comments. Um, yeah, why should we spend so much money on the police? <laughs> that is not yeah. helping me. I, I also just want to acknowledge that I know that um, uh, from the names in the in the group here that there, there are several of you who work in um, in warehouse positions and I want to just reiterate what Andrea said that um, I think that many of you have called out the ways in which you know it's a job right and it's a job that you know is, is a respectable job. We wish that you were paid more. Um, we wish that there were benefits for everyone. We wish that there were more um, opportunities for other jobs. And I think that th that also some of you have noted as well that um, the school training programs that are where high schools um, and college programs are funded 
essentially by Amazon and for logistics training that in some cases they are making very good promises for engineering jobs in logistics, which are high paying jobs. However, most of those jobs, especially at the high school level, are, are not in learning the um, engineering elements of doing logistics as, um, you know, in terms of the data management and rather are about learning to be warehouse workers, which people have talked about as, you know, the, in terms of really trying to sustain the area as one that Yvonne described as people, um, a persistence of poverty or a proletarianization, uh, right, where people are, are forming a group that can barely make it on the wages that are there. And so there's an honoring of that profession, but I do think that this area um, has a lot of promise in terms of the ways in which, for instance, medical industries are offering, um, slowly offering more training programs and the ways in which public health has been attentive to the different communities and the ways that there's a great need for that. And so I just wanted to kind of call out the idea that it, this is this is all incremental. And I think a lot of the same people working on the environmental issues are working on the issues around public health and then also bringing in the ways that medical, um, some additional kinds of jobs um, should be, you know, coming up through the pipeline in, in the area. And I kind of see that as a bit of hope, quite honestly, the idea of um, just diversifying the professional opportunities. Um, okay, thank you everyone. And um, let me, uh, you know, I would love to kind of continue this, but I, I want to respect everyone's time. And, and um, let me also clarify that um, I convened this with you, Kathy Gudis. So um, you are my co-convener and, you know, we worked on this together. So thank you for doing that with me. Um, thank you for pulling it off. <laughs> And thank you, Ellen and Andrea, uh, for being here and, and offering your wisdom and, and for all of your work and Dylan for uh, setting the table for us to start us off. And thank you, everyone who attended um, and, and asked questions and threw in comments and links and just listened. Um, we appreciate you. All right. I'll say, I'll say good night.